Hey guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Retro Adventures. And at the end of another week, and the end of another poll, we've got a very clear winner with Supernova for the Star Wars role-playing game. So we'll cover that in the desktop in a wee second. And as usual, I'll be back at the end of the video with some other channel-related stuff, and some other poll-related stuff. But, a wee reminder that if you'd like to help the channel out, or you'd like to see these videos a week early, or you'd like to become a real, honest-to-goodness, fake laird of Scotland, then check out our Patreon in the description down below and see how you can help us out. It'd be very much appreciated. Anyway, let's have a look at Supernova. So, this is Supernova. It's a Star Wars role-playing game adventure by West End Games, which came out in 1993. Now, in Chatter Online, where people are discussing this set of adventures, they tend to group it with the final products, which came out from West End Games in 1997. Because the quality of products that West End Games was producing in their final year wasn't quite as high as they'd done before. There's still some great books in there, but generally it's believed because they'd lost a lot of their A-list talent, they'd moved their headquarters and started recruiting people more local, the, the quality was down, and some of the books weren't as great. But Supernova's proof that this happened from time to time before, because this came out four years before then, and it's not great. It is a set of heavily flawed adventures, although the concept for them is absolutely fantastic. Um, as it says, Rebels race against time to save doomed people. Because this is set during the supernova of a star. Five adventures based on planets and colonies around a star which is about to go nova. So the planets are being evacuated. People are rushing out of the system. There's an apocalypse coming. These worlds are going to end and everybody's trying to get out. And the rebels, of course, need to get their assets out of the area. The Empire's trying to make sure that people who are anti-imperial in sentiment are the ones stuck behind, so will be wiped out when the star blows up, etc., etc. These are brilliant concepts and a wonderful time limit on adventures, because you've got this supernova coming. It's an apocalyptic campaign. Really, really interesting stuff. But the adventures themselves are quite flawed. But let's have a look at the back cover and then we'll work our way through. Star Wars Supernova by Stephen H. Lorenz, Brian J. Murphy, William Olmistel, Bill Smith and Stuart Worley. The inhabitants of the Demophon system face a threat far greater than that of the Empire. Their sun is about to go supernova, destroying all life on the worlds around it. A band of determined rebels must act to save those the Empire deems unfit to live, while solving the dark mysteries of Demophon. Encounter the bizarre Slithers, or Sithers, sorry, and the monstrous Lagoin. Struggle to survive the virus codenamed Minuk. Battle your way into the heart of Imperial security to rescue rebel prisoners. The explosive new adventure collection features five exciting mini-adventures and an overview of the Demophon system. 96-page book features five mini-adventures set in around the doomed Demophon system, featuring new NPCs and diagrams. A detailed look at the planets of the Demophon system and its great domed cities. A first look at the mysterious new alien race. Dramatic read-alouds to bring the action to life. So that's what it is. However, the back cover isn't actually telling the truth. So we start off inside. West End Games artwork was lovely. And we start off with a planet log and information about the Demophon system. It talks it through. It's got including the Traveller's Advisory here for travellers who come out of hyperspace around the system. Space travel in the Demophon system is considered to be hazardous due to an impending supernova. Pilots are advised to pay strict attention to all warning beacons and the directions of planet-side controllers, particularly in view of the ever-increasing amount of traffic connected with the evacuation operations. The Empire has imposed martial law on Demophon for the duration of this crisis. Search and seizure of contraband from visiting ships is a daily occurrence. So, the Empire is trying to deal with this disaster because it is the galactic government. But obviously the Empire is also being the Empire and dooming people it considers to be hostile to death. It's only rescuing those it likes. Anyway, we've got things like the workday with the um, lockdowns and curfews. Talks through the economy, the capital city called Burn City, what the law is, who it's enforced by. 
And then we've got the first adventure, Infiltration. The party finds a way to make a few credits by shipping some equipment off the doomed planet of Demophon. Because they're not rebels. But the back cover said they were rebels. A, determined, a band of determined rebels. Well, first adventure, you're not rebels. You're a freighter crew. Now, there's nothing to say, I suppose, that you couldn't be both. You can be a bunch of rebels with their freighter trying to earn some money. But the adventures do kind of skip between the two. So this adventure is that they are hired to uh, bring some equipment off the world. They arrive with their ship. They've got to go through customs. They've got to deal with the situation because people are trying to get off. Riots are starting to happen as people realise that not everybody's going to make it off the world. But the Empire's firmly in control here because the disaster's still a distance off. You can get it when they smuggle the equipment out. They get chased by TIE fighters. The usual sort of Star Wars action. However, when they reach the destination planets with the equipment that they've just smuggled off the world, they discover that these are not equipment. These are political prisoners who they've just helped smuggle off in crates. And they offer a large amount of money for the players to return and rescue some more of their comrades who happen to be in the Imperial Security Bureau headquarters. So it talks about them going back to the city. They can take their own ship or they can go on a passenger line, the Dread, Dread Imperative. Now, which they take is fairly important because they stand a good chance of losing this type of transport here because the adventure takes them in a different direction. And that's one of the flaws of these adventures because we will come to various other occasions. I think there's three within five adventures where the players lose their ship. Now, I don't know about other groups of players for Star Wars, but my players tend to hang on to their ships. They love them. They are Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon. They don't want to be getting ship after ship destroyed. They would get really annoyed because they spend their time upgrading it, customising it and all that stuff. Anyway, the players arrive. They have to find out information off a bartender, where the um, captives are. They find out about the Imperial Security Bureau building. Um, they have to break in. There are some lovely diagrams of what a prefabricated Imperial base is like. A very, very useful thing to have. The Imperial bases, the prefab bases, have been mentioned and only very lightly diagrammed in other places, but this is the most detailed that I've seen, where we've got different sub-levels beneath the ground. It goes through all the sections and what guards, entrance levels, division levels command levels and the flight support deck. The flight support deck being very important because that's kind of the way the adventure channels you, that you break into the prison, you rescue a prisoner and you head up to the top and you steal an Imperial shuttle and flee that way. Although if you've got a ship you might be heading back towards it but you'll have to fight your way back through the base and blow your way out of customs etc etc. Or you can be heading back to the Dread Imperative and smuggling yourselves aboard. Um, the adventure allows itself to finish in several ways, but it's heavily channeling you towards the Imperial Shuttles. As you can see the diagrams, it's talking about the Great Escape, it's got what it's got stats for the Imperial Shuttle here, it's got an immobilizer class cruiser, which attempts to use its gravity wells to stop you escaping. Although I have to say that looks more like a Starwing Assault Shuttle rather than a Lambda class. But that's just the geek in, in me coming out that I recognise these kind of things. Um, it's got details of how the Dread Imperative, if you end up smuggling yourself back in, perhaps you bribe the captain to allow you off. And then we're on to the second adventure, because that wraps it up. They've rescued all the people off the planet that they were hired to rescue. The Minot Conspiracy has a bunch of rebels and is nothing to do with the supernova. Basically, in an area of space near to the supernova, in the same sector, there's a planet with giant floating farms in the atmosphere of a gas giant. And the rebels send some rebel agents to deal with 
people on one of these have been lost contact with. And the adventure is fairly straightforward in that you go and investigate and you find that a bunch of droids have turned on their masters, they've gone rogue, and it's a computer virus that's been spread into them. And there's a rival corporation that's trying to profit out of the farms, etc. There's authorities who are trying to spread the news of this massacre spreading. The rebels have all sorts of problems. We've got cloud skiffs for getting around the gas giant. It's an interesting selection. It's quite fun having players go up against droids. That's fairly rare for a Star Wars adventure. It's got a section where they have to identify which of the droids introduced the virus because it has special hardware to carry the virus and they have to locate it and that allows them to counter the virus and make things safe. And now we've got various sections about here the different loading platforms for the cargo. And the third adventure is Triple Cross. Now this you're back to being a freighter crew. So you've been the freighter crew in the first adventure, rebels in the second adventure and now you're back to being the freighter crew. These adventures really don't hang together too well. And you're returning to Demphorn, which seems a bit odd given that the first adventure, where you were the same freighter crews presumably, unless you're playing different characters every single adventure, blasted your way off the world. You went past an uh, interdictor cruiser, you fought your way off the planet. So now you're coming back, when probably you are known quantities. It's a world you don't really want to revisit. Anyway, maybe there's profit to be made. Your players are willing to do anything for cash. So the freighter crew returns. And basically they are to smuggle a family off the planet. A rich family wants to be smuggled off. They don't have a legitimate way off the world. They just want to have what's on their back. But they want to get away. So you have the difficulty of locating them. And during this time your ship gets stolen. And you have to break into a facility to re uh, obtain your ship from the network. You can see there's lots of ships in their shipyard. And that's about it. There's various problems in locating them and extricating them from their situation. And of course the problems getting your ship back. But that's about it. It's not a terribly complex adventure. And it doesn't make a lot of sense when put in to the first one. And then we've got the third, ad uh, sorry, fourth adventure, the evacuation of Jati, where you're back to being rebel agents. Now, Jati is a mining installation and there's rebel agents there. So the rebels are sending you in to rescue them. Now you are given a ship, which is a good idea because you don't want your players to be using their good ship. They're given a battered old um, YT-1300, the one-liner. Um, Space speed 3, zero maneuverability, it's barely crawling along compared to other ships. 2D plus 1 hull. Um, a really battered, ruined old YT-1300. You set out to rescue the people from the asteroid base. And the trick of it is your ship gets damaged, even worse. And then you discover the amount of people you need to rescue is more than the YT-1300 can carry. So you need to steal another ship from a mining installation. Fortunately, for some reason, this ratty old YT-1300, which a good quality one will cost about 27,000 credits, happens to be carrying a number of power suits, which are worth 30,000 credits each. Which explains why the freighter wasn't maintained very well, because they were spending all their money on power armour. But you can use that power armour to go across the surface of the planet, you meet up the sliver, uh, the scyther, sorry. You can deal with them and you steal a bulk cruiser. Oh, sorry, a repair vessel. Much larger, you can make off with, which has enough passenger capacity to rescue everybody that you're rescuing. A short adventure, um, but nothing to do with the planet itself. But I do like the fact that this is in the same system. It's not just one planet, it's everything in the systems needing to be evacuated. So that one does fit in quite well. And the final adventure is the beginning of the end. Where there's a missing rebel agent on the planet, the rebels are sent back to extricate him. 
So there's the usual dealings with it. The planet itself is absolute chaos because the time is really counting down here. Everybody's wanting off the planet. Um, riots are happening. The danger of your ship getting stolen is incredibly high. In fact, it does get stolen. Um, there's various things obviously players could do to ruin this situation because it is so obvious that their ship and any transport off the world is in high demand and their ship might get stolen. They might decide to leave some players back and secure it. But the Games Master's going to have to work around that to make sure the ship gets stolen. Because they follow the clues until they eventually discover a pirate um, who is smuggling people off the world. Um, Slakar village, the rebel ship, they find uh, Captain Jaw and Tell. And they find that the rebel agent has paid for passage with the pirate to get smuggled off the world. They need passage, so they're paying him as well. But it describes as they're leaving the planet aboard the Nightwind, another YT 1300. Um, they discover in the hold lots of dead bodies, including the rebel agent. And all the loot that the pirate captain's taken off. And he offers them a chance to work for him. Um, join me and I'll make you rich or fight me and join the carrion in the hold. And they get to fight the pirate to basically punish him for killing the rebel agent. They get his ship to make up for the loss of their ship. And the information the rebel agent had is on a data stick he is carrying. So they can complete their mission in recovering the important stuff the rebel agent had even if he himself is dead. So that's the supernova set of adventures. As I said, they don't stick together terribly well. You know, you're a freighter crew, you're a set of rebels, you're a freighter crew, you're rebels, you're rebels. And then again, your first rebel adventures, not even set in the system where the supernova's happening, has nothing at all to do with the supernova. It's just an extra adventure stuck in. But... There's some intriguing stuff in there. I think there could be a lot of satisfaction at the end of the last adventure of fighting and slaughtering the pirate and his sidekicks for the death of the rebel agent. There's some other in interesting situations I think that could be fun to be had in using the power suits to travel across an asteroid and steal an Imperial uh, repair ship. To use that to rescue the people that you're trying to rescue. And I think the doom and gloom as the last days of the planet come about, as people are panicking, as people finally realise that they are not getting off this planet and everything goes to absolute pot. Um, chaos, riots, death, all the fun of uh, the absolute imminent apocalypse which is incoming. Um, I think that could be a lot of fun, especially as the time pressure to get off before they too are wiped out with the planet. So that was Supernova and that won the poll this week on some 27% of the vote. Ahead of the joint second positions of Queen Euphoria for Shadowrun and Death on the Right for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which both got 22%. Now for part of the week I thought Death on the Right might actually win because it was pulling up very close to Supernova, but Supernova pulled away which let me cover the Star Wars D6 system which is one of my favourite role-playing games, one that I still run, even though it went out of production, what, some 20, 25 years ago now. Coming up behind them was the Call of Cthulhu adventure, The Stars Are Right, on 18%, and then way behind was Out in the Black for the Serenity role-playing game on only 11%. But as usual, they're all cleared out of the poll, and we're going back to a retro RPG one. So this week I would like to present Year of the Comment, for Shadowrun. Now this isn't a Fazza book, this is a fan pro one. So it was after Fazza had sold the license off. And this is another one of the books like Bug City, like Rinraku Arcology Shutdown, where the world changes. There are world shattering events in this book and the Shadowrun world changes slightly. It's still the same world, but it's introducing new concepts and changing areas in the world. Next we've got The Last Crusaders for Deadlands Hell on Earth. 
Now this is the book of the Holy Knights, the sort of paladins of that post-apocalyptic world. It's a very interesting book because they are very interesting characters. They all got infantry weapons of the world for Twilight 2000, an equipment source book, but when this came out, Games Designers Workshop was also supporting a number of other role-playing games, including Dark Conspiracy. So they included some equipment for that game in this book. So for Twilight 2000, a post-apocalyptic game, there's now laser rifles and other equipment, which makes it quite a fun and interesting book to look at for that setting. Then we've got Realms of Sorcery for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Now this was a Hogshead book designed to flesh out the magic system, because the magic system was seen as one of the broken parts of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1st Edition. So this attempted to belt that out and make it a far more interesting and complete magic system. And finally we've got Immortal the Invisible War by Precedence Entertainment. Now this is one of the last full role-playing games that I have in my collection that I haven't covered yet. Because we're getting onto mainly source books for other games now. There's a few games which I haven't covered, but this is one of them. So it'd be nice to cover a game we haven't touched in any way before. So let's see how those get on. Another channel related news. Well, I've released various videos on the OGL license things, and that's all in the past. Basically, where I'm sat recording this, Wizard of the Coast just released a press release saying they've looked at the survey they've been running, and they've decided that they are kind of scrapping all their OGL 1.1, 1.2. They're releasing their source material as Creative Commons license, and they're not revoking the original OGL. And if you're writing for Dungeons and Dragons, you can do it Creative Commons, or you can do it OGL uh, 1.0a. It's completely up to you. So, there is no big drama anymore. Everything's over. Everybody won. Wizards of the Coast are claiming they've won. Um, the fans are claiming that they've beaten Hasbro. Everybody won. We've got what we wanted, and kind of what some of us were saying was going to happen anyway, that Wizards wasn't going to destroy the role-playing industry. So... I'm not going to make a separate video about that. Consider this the end of the subject as far as I'm concerned, because I am well sick of it. Another channel-related stuff apart from that, not much. The Discord channel's being very quiet at the moment, but I pop in from time to time to see if there's anybody commenting in there, if there's anybody who wants to chat. But as I said, it's been very uh, quiet the last couple of weeks. Apart from that, I've no new news. So I guess I've whittled on for quite long enough. So thank you very, very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now.